Hello everyone, I'm Kim Jenny. I'm Director of Connectional Ministries for the Missouri Annual Conference and I am here today in the conference office with two of my favorite people, uh, <laughs> Reverend Fred Least and Reverend Dale Stone. And we're, uh, we've now spent four weeks in part of the webinar on pastoring in partisan times and we want to have a live Facebook event with two of our pastors who have seen a lot of mystery of uh, ministry in mystery probably for the, that matter um, and have experienced what it means to pastor in partisan times and we thought that we would just spend some time in conversation today unpacking what we've seen over the past four weeks um, across Mike McCurry Leah Gunning Francis Adam Hamilton and David Gushi and the wisdom they brought to this conversation and we thought we'd talk a little bit about um, our own thoughts around that and we invite you to be a part of that conversation so if there are questions that you have for these two guys um, regarding uh, what you've seen over the past four weeks we invite you to be a part of that in addition I just want to remind you that those webinars were recorded and are available on our website at momethodist.org forward slash partisan times webinar. So you can watch any of the ones you may have missed. You can rewatch some ones that you appreciated. We've also included some resources that each week were referenced as part of those conversations. And so I hope you check that out and share perhaps with a friend who might find them to be helpful as they try to navigate uh, the waters that we find ourselves in in increasingly partisan times. And so maybe just as we start, the two of you could kind of share just a little bit about who you are, where you've served, what kind of churches you've served, just to kind of give those who don't know you a little bit of perspective. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Dale Stone, and uh, I retired a year ago in well, June of 2016, and was a pastor about 40 years, and served mostly in small town rural congregations uh, first in northwest Iowa and then in Missouri and the last six years I served as superintendent of the Mark Twain district uh, in the Missouri conference all right I'm Fred least uh, I've been in ministry pastoral ministry for about close to 40 years now um, served in the United Methodist connection the last 25 years or so um, southeast Missouri uh, in Dexter Sykeston uh, then I went to uh, Kearney, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City, served a church there, and then back to Southeast Missouri as Southeast District Superintendent for five years, and now I'm at Missouri United Methodist here in Columbia. Great. Well, you do have decades of experience, so, I'm, but I'm going to refrain from calling you experts <laughs> with regard to Please, yeah. <laughs> how to deal with some of these issues that I know that many of the pastors that participated in this webinar series are really struggling with. I mean, this is... As, as former <clears throat> district superintendents, you've seen it from a couple of different angles, right? You've seen sure. it in your own experience, but also in supervising pastors who are trying to figure out how they pastor a church um, that might be imploding with regard to political concerns and how somebody weighs their prophetic call to ministry, how to, how to uh, balance their proclamation um, with the pastoral care piece of ministry. And so you've seen it from a couple of different ways. And so um, having viewed these uh, four different perspectives, I just kind of wonder what your overall impressions were, what you thought of the series, anything struck you, anything surprised you? I'm going to defer to my elder. So, <laughs> Well, uh, I found each of them had a different kind of input, and I appreciated that. And I wrote down kind of just... Two or three word descriptions, kind of mm -hmm. what I thought maybe summed up each one. So Mike Curry, um, the first speaker, I really respected his experience in terms of being in some very tense situations as being the Clinton press secretary. Mm -hmm. So he brought a lot about how to communicate in very difficult places. Uh, Dr. Or Leah Gunning Francis, mm -hmm. I felt in her a lot of passion and impatience, and I felt probably because her experience was different than mine or some of the other speakers, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it seemed more understandable that she would be impatient with some of the things that maybe I'm more patient with. Um, Adam, I thought, was very practical and realistic. And as we said earlier, I mean, I've heard Adam before. He's very well thought out to the point. And then uh, D David Gushi, I just, I liked him because he made me think. He, I felt like he took me to the theory or the reasons behind how we do. 
uh, to be honest, at first I thought he might seem a little dry, but it, ultimately I think I really expected, I respected that he made me, took me to a different level of thinking about the issues. Mm -hmm. So, and, and he also has practical experience. Right, so. right. What about you, Fred? What did you think? Well, I, I tended to think back through the uh, different weeks and what I took from each person. So from Adam, uh, uh, you know, he talked about the need to develop what he called relational and leadership capital certainly before you jump into any difficult conversation, especially if it's a something a, a issue you're addressing from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. and, and they had this idea that, you know, churches need to be challenged and stretched, but he used that image of the, the rubber band that if it stretches too David Gushy, uh, you know, when he talked about addressing social issues uh, as a part of a balanced diet in the church and, uh, uh, and as an overall program of proclamation, and it didn't just have to do with every Sunday morning what happened in the pulpit, but right. there were other tools and other opportunities to have those kind of conversations. That was a good reminder. I mean, I knew that, but it was helpful. And then Leah Gunning Francis, she, she a couple of times talked about sticking with what she called some foundational biblical groundings, that stuff that we obviously can unite around, some middle ground, so to speak, and then maybe the difficult conversation is reflecting together on how you then live that out right. in, in community in the local church. Uh, that seemed like a good approach to me. Um, so, and then Mike, McCur Mike McCurry uh, talking about just some basic communication principles. Again, stuff that I think we know, but not uh, not bad to be reminded of those kind of things. So, right. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I'm struck by is I think too often we are hoping for kind of like a magic bullet to like make conflict or controversial topics like disappear. And one of the things I guess I appreciated of the, the four is they admit this hard stuff, right? This is, right. Uh, there isn't a kind of a, you know, one solution that's going to resolve this. Or if you, um, if you deploy this particular tool or this approach that, life's going to be easy, right? Um, but I do hear that a lot from folks. Is like, just tell me what I'm supposed to do to make this all go away, right? Um, what has been, like, your advice to pastors that are, like, when you, especially in the district superintendency, what, how did you approach this when pastors were struggling with, with these kinds of topics? Like, what was the counsel that you, or maybe even a better question is, what had you wished you had said to them in the midst of this? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things I would always say to a pastor first is you, you have to build up trust. I mean, if you don't build up trust, people aren't going to listen to you. And, and it's pretty enough. It's kind of like we know that. But I think when we're on a difficult issue or we're a new pastor in a setting, sometimes we're impatient to take some time to get to know people and get to know the context in which people are, are at. And another phrase I came to understand and appreciate is, I may feel strongly about a certain issue, I may be a conservative or a progressive or whatever, but don't lead with that all the time. Sometimes you just have to. So I think it's, it's patient, patience, and it's not always even knowing how, like you said, there's no magic book. I may have it all on a sheet of paper and Bob comes in and lays into me. I don't really know. That's you just kind of have to, part of it's just learning on the job. Right. Doing the best you can, and as one speaker said, have grace with yourself. Right. You know, we're going to blow it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think some advice that I have given before um, is that, you know, if I was to say to a new pastor, for instance, I would say, listen and learn and then lead and in that order. Mm -hmm because I think it only happens in that order. Actually, it's hard to lead unless you've listened and learned. And so I'm, I'm in the process of learning about a new congregation I'm serving. Right. And um, I, I'm only five months in, and, and I'm still learning a whole lot about the culture at Missouri United Methodist Church um, and learning that some assumptions you may have had about the church before I got there are maybe not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's, I think it's just important for, for new, any pastor, but certainly new pastors, to really know who the congregation is. I mean, really know who they are, hear their story, and listen first. Um, so um, that, that's probably the main thing I would say. You know, exegete the congregation. I mean, I, I know we have to understand what's happening in the in, in the cultural you know surroundings, and uh, and we obviously ex, uh, exegete scripture and know what scripture says. But exegeting that congregation and knowing who they are um, is 
critically important. So. Yeah, and I and I think that that's something we don't talk enough about, like whether it be at the seminary level or course study level, <clears throat> about giving folks tools for how to do that community exegesis. If I think Jim Osher maybe came up with that that term, community exegesis. Um, but how do you read the context in, in which you're currently in? How have you guys approached that in the past when you've been appointed to a new place? Like, how do you learn your community? How do you, how do you learn to, to figure out, like, in, the way Adam approached it is he really spends a lot of time trying to figure out what the different sides are to an issue. So when you're, when you're appointed to a new place, how have you gone about learning the community? What does that look like? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll launch in first on this one and give Dale time to think. Uh, since I've been doing that, um, you know, we started out at, at, uh, at Missouri United Methodist with a series of uh, basically meet and greets, kind of get togethers, and um, I did a lot of listening and had some questions posed that kind of gave me a chance to uh, uh, have folks lift up what they feel about their church and tell me who they are. And so I did a lot of listening. It also happens not just in group settings. I find that just listening carefully in conversation with people, it might be folks that drop into the office or folks that just, you know, in casual conversation, you hear, you, you get a sense of the ethos of the local church. Yeah. So I honestly just, even if it's not, even if it's not in a formal setting, I try in every situation just to kind of listen a little deeply to hear what people are really saying about who they are. So, you know, obviously there's some formal arrangements that happen when a new pastor usually comes in. Right. But uh, listening to stories and just uh, hearing people describe who they think they are. And, you know, sometimes you find out, I'm finding out that sometimes churches are a lot better about remembering who they were hmm. than really understanding who they are. So you may be hearing when you listen to everybody some reflections about where the church really is at and who they really are. And you might can reflect back to them, too, a little bit about uh, some misconceptions they may have even about who they are. Right. But anyway, that's how I do it, just in conversation with folks. Mm -hmm. And how do, but when we get to like controversial topics, or mm -hmm. when you start to like wade into the waters of like at least trying to figure out the history of a particular community, whether it's they have a history of redlining around you know neighborhoods or some of the kind of the systems of oppression that communities tend to create, like how do you, how do you start to figure out like where people might be on a particular issue. I mean, today's church, we have um, gun violence is a, is a, you know, hot topic right now, especially in light of what happened in Texas. And, um, you know, where do you, where do you start to figure out, um, especially if scripture is calling you to take a stance on something, where your folks are? I think one place is you just, you just visit with people. I mean, I always appreciated going to people's homes when I could because I felt like then I was on their territory. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that often opened up a conversation, or maybe to a restaurant, but off a church property. Um, I was going to say earlier, I think when you're new at a church, that you want to let them know you want to be there. Mm -hmm. I, people are very quick to pick up if a pastor's really not wanting to be there. and how that opens up communication. I think in Sunday, frank, frankly, Bible study, Sunday school, you're gonna hear where some of the church is. You don't have to ask where are you on gun violence, it's just gonna come up in conversations. Um, so I, I think there's different, you know, the newspaper, visiting with people, I mean, you begin to feel where a community is. I think it's also, we have to be really careful not to make divides too clear. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be somebody here on some issues, but there on some issues. And in some some of the conversation and the questions that came up, it seemed like it was, I don't want to overstate it, it was like, we're here and they're here. I think yeah. those are two final lines to, to really be beneficial, and they're probably not accurate. Yeah. Um, there's people who are even in a smaller church, there's more variety if we take the time to listen. Um, in terms of if you feel called to speak to it, um, th I don't know if this sounds like a cop-out, but it takes time to discern that. And most of these topics did not come up overnight. You know, somebody said, you know, when I was a, a new superintendent, when somebody calls up and says, we need to have this meeting today because our pastor's driving us nuts or something, 
Remember, that's probably been brewing for three months. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these issues have been taking some time. So I may be passionate. I may want to speak to them, but I'm not going to solve it in a week. And it didn't just come up. So people have been mulling this over uh, for a while. And like Fred said about uh, David Gushi, there's a, lots of ways you can address it as a pastor. The, right. the preaching, uh, the announcements. I like how David Gushi kind of said he reclaimed the role of the pastoral prayer not to preach but to help people reflect on love and compassion and so right. i think those are other ways you can do it without just pushing it yeah. over too quick yeah I, for I, me it's yeah. not like i think yeah. a doctor uh francis i think she'd be impatient with that kind of stance yeah you know? and you know for you know some people may be called specifically to prophecy right Right. Um, and as I think we joked, I think it might have been during the conversation with Adam, you know, most prophets didn't live with the community, right? right? right. We need prophets as a healthy part of kind of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but when those of us that have been called to pastoral ministry, prophecy is one piece oh, no. of it, right? So I kind of appreciated the combination of that, ba that balanced diet approach. Right. I think that that's really a helpful understanding. And as I reflect back on the past year, have I been in, you know, imbalanced or balanced? Um, and I think every year, you know, I, I think a, a week, a month, it's probably too short of a period of time to kind of really assess that. But we start to look back over a season in the life of the church or a year in the life of the church. That's helpful. Yeah, I think you're right. Right? Yeah. Up against, like, what Adam said about the capital, like the investing in people and getting to know them. And he had kind of a really long um, view. Now, he's been in his congregation for a really long time, right? Um, so he kind of said, I, you know, I don't think I could be preaching some of the sermons I'm preaching now right. in that first five years of being mm -hmm. appointed here, right? I didn't right. have that trust built up. <clears throat> right. um, I think for the Methodist itinerant pastor, that's sometimes hard to figure out. Do I have enough capital built up? How do, how do you know when you have trust? What kind of signs do you see? Well, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just, I was trying to, how do you know? I don't know if I have a technique. I think somehow you, you begin to feel it, but what I was thinking, in every community that I've been at, I think most people would know that after a few years, I would be involved in one of the political parties. Mm -hmm. or I would be uh, involved in some group that worked on racial issues. And um, so I guess I think, you know, I, I believed if people knew I was their pastor and I cared about them, that then I could be involved in these ways, but I didn't get up in the pulpit and say, here's what you should be doing. Um, so I guess I probably in somewhat an answer to your question, I think when I began to feel that trust and I felt freer to get involved in a, in a political party mm -hmm. and people would know that or involved. So I don't know exactly if there's a way I felt trusted, but I just risk, if you will, going, okay, now I want to live out this part of me, which isn't necessarily the pastoral role, but I want to be involved in a party or I want to be involved in this issue. So, but I wouldn't have done that the first year, the first month, but after a while, and then if somebody said something eventually we could kind of back then I think have a pretty decent conversation I, I do think that partisanship is a lot tighter now yeah. than it was and mm -hmm. so that for you that was just a, an important part of who you were is to actually have a life outside the church uh, in the political realm right did you ever see those two things in tension or in con you know conflict with one another no I, I did because I didn't I mean, I guess what I'm thinking of the one church in particular because I was the pastor, the commissioner, a couple other the very staunch Republicans. I was, a, we could talk about it and joke about it, and in some ways we we allowed each other that freedom, and yet we also joined on Sunday to worship together. Right. And so, if you will, the God who brought us together in spite of our differences, that was a good place rather than. We have to be separate now. Go to this church and we'll go to this church. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I don't ever remember that being the only time I really did have somebody leave was when I put up a school board member sticker. My, 
front of, and I don't know why that one <laughs> ticked somebody off, but that's not that wasn't exactly hugely partisan, but I put up a, a poster for somebody. But I never had anybody approach me and say, why are you doing this right. in a party or on this racial issue? Right. But I think they, by that time, learned I really did care about them and I wanted to be there, but this was something I could live out, but I didn't expect everybody to live it out. I might have deep down thought they should more, but I didn't expect them and didn't lay it on them. So yeah. I always felt I was respected in those places. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think that, I mean, that a lot, it's kind of like the call to be prophetic. Mm -hmm. In some ways that came out a little bit off of the church position, but it did allow me to live that. And then maybe then I didn't always feel that I had to do it there at church, but I could live it out here in a way. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's separating my call or not, but it seemed Well, I, I mean, you it, know, we, we mentioned that maybe things have changed a little bit and i wonder right. you know in today's climate would you be able to to do that as right. as well um there also seems to be a lot of confusion among people in our congregations about what the separation of church and state yeah. means i mean i don't know if you guys hear that uh when people are yeah. feeling like we're getting too political like well you know this, i hear people say that all the time <laughs> separation of church and state like it's like the church and the state are not somehow in relationship with one another. How, how have you approached that when people have said the church has no business whatsoever talking about politics? That's kind of tricky, actually, I find, because, um, because when some of the political debates and issues that are, that are out there, like immigration or, or gun uh, you know, control or... Mm -hmm. or you know, racism and bigotry or whatever, um, you know, it's, those are obviously issues that the church is, speaks into. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, and yet when you, as a pastor, you weigh in, especially in the pulpit on Sunday mornings on right. some of those issues, it's easy for folks to assume that you're uh, being a religious voice in the pulpit for one or the other side of the political divide. And that's where I found David... Uh, gushy to be helpful because when he talked about we're rooted in a 4,000 year tradition Hebrew tradition and 2,000 year Christian tradition and a 500 year Reformation tradition that is a pretty robust and rich tradition that it's a, it, it would be a shame to yield that and just abandon that because we have to speak out of that so I, sometimes I think you have to remind people that that we have a we have a heritage you know theological and ethical heritage in the in the church that we speak out of and we speak to some of those things so but what I try to—I mean, honestly—I try to—I try to begin with biblical groundings first. I try not to even—I mean, to me, that's where it begins. It's what the scriptures say about how God's people respond right. or react, and and then I try not to tell people uh, how they engage either. By the way, um, but but you know, Adam said, you know, he's this side, this side. Here's what scripture says. Here's how I interpret this. I, I kind of—I think. Uh, sometimes I don't lay out the arguments on both sides like Adam does. I just cut to the core and say, right. you know, this is kind of what Scripture says about who we are and our identity. And um, but even given that, some people interpret that, right. you know, as 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 taking sides or whatever. And um, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I think so. you know, Leah Gunning Francis. She she did reference something similar to that about. A, helping people realize what their response could be you know and to me it reminded me of you know it, within the body of Christ everybody has a different role to play and she was saying not everybody is called to be on the streets and doing that kind of action some people are and you know we should sure. encourage that but some people are called to, to do kind of the, the behind the scenes work around that or the deep prayer work that needs to happen mm -hmm. around that and it seems to me that part of the role of the pastor is to help a congregation figure out not only what the congregational response to a particular injustice is, but what is the individual believer disciples' response? What could what could that be? Um, and we get into trouble when it when we maybe get maybe too prescriptive about our response, sure, right? And people hear, you know, a different story than maybe what we're trying to, to sure. share. Yeah, I heard that in what Dr. Francis said too. And I mean, she talked about these. There are these biblical groundings that are hard to get away from because right. that's who we are, yeah. and yet, 
the, the real challenge is how do you challenge people and stretch people to say, then how do we live this out in community? What's your role in this? How do you engage? I do find as a pastor, it's very, it's, it's just, it's not my style to tell anybody what they have to do. I mean, there's some people that like to march and protest, and some people like to write letters and, and uh, you know, in a personal way, lobby their congressman and talk to their congressmen uh, or women. Uh, other folks like to have conversations with, with other people, and they think that it's better off if they have more and better conversations with people and try to, you know, quietly learn and maybe even impact somebody else's life through conversation. But everybody does that a little differently. I think we are wired differently yeah. in the way we engage. And I do find it's troubling to be prescriptive about what someone has to do and how they have to engage. Right. Yeah. And it seems like it makes the work hard, really, really hard to figure out what the communal response is. Um, because not everybody's going to be supportive if, if, a, if a particular community decides we want to do this as a, as a church response to it. I mean, we see this right. at the general church level, right? Sure. You know, we have a, an entire general agency, church and society, that by their very um, kind of chartering is to be a, a religious and a faithful voice on Capitol Hill, right? Like that's their, sure. their chartering. Like the people that created them, our early, you know, brothers and sisters said, you know, that's what they exist to be. And people get all sorts of mad over positions they hold, which they believe are biblically rooted sure. and out of our faith tradition. And out of the discipline and out, and or resolutions. Out of the social principles, right? The resolu in the book of resolutions. But uh, folks in our congregations get often very angry at positions the general church holds. Um, and there may be positions the general church hold that you disagree with on a personal level. How do you, how do you help a church figure out how to wrestle with like a, a personal disagreement with a general church statement? I mean, um, and or how do you personally deal with a disagreement that you may see that, well, the general church has said this, but I disagree on a personal level. How do you how do you wrestle with that? How do you hold those things in tension? Well, I, I had a really immediately response when you put that in the questions you sent us and calls like that's life. Yeah. I mean, in my family, I have an opinion on where we should go on vacation, and no, yeah, there's no one. He go there. said nobody. You know, wanted yeah. to go there. <laughs> and um, I think in the you know in my job, in the government, there's. And so part of it is it can't all balance out with what I agree with. I mean, I, I think if we fight that one, it's like you're saying, a perfect hell, we're, we're never going to be happy. I mean, we're going to live in this dissonance between all that we believe and all that's happening around us. So I, I think we have to allow that that's not wrong, that's the way it is. But I, I know that part of what our conversation is about, it's highly partisan now more than it's been um, in the past. So, um, I, anyway, I just wanted to say part of it is I think this is the way life is, you know. Right. We, and we, if, if I as a pastor think in two years I'm gonna get this congregation to think this way because of my wonderful preaching and effective leadership, I'm mistaken because it, you know, it doesn't really work even with my kids, so why would it work? <laughs> and, and another thing on, on partisan issues, you know, like where I stand on certain issues today, I didn't stand 5, 10, 20 years ago. Well, I didn't come to that with one sermon. Right. So you have to have, you listen, you have conversations. So it's a slow process. Right. But I, I, I do want to say, I, I, what I can't understand, what I can't relate to always is the impatience that some would feel who felt pain in a different way than I have. Right. Uh, you know, um, right now we're having all the accusations sexual um, misconduct on a national level or uh, being certain minorities. I mean, I can't relate right. to that. So I, I, I always try to say there there is a place for impatience. Urgency. And urgency. That, righteous anger that's a, even. This righteous mm -hmm. anger. And, and I that's something I need to balance out. Where's my thing just holding back because I'm afraid yeah. and where's the place to be more out front? So, you know, that's part of that tension too. Right. Mm -hmm. I used to tell people in um, kind of the, the small group conversations or around people that want to be committed to the community that you're not going to you're not going to agree with everything that's said here. But if you find yourself in a place where you agree with everything the a particular community is saying and doing, that you probably have wandered into a cult 
of some kind <laughs> rather than yeah. a church, right? Not that I came out of a cult because I didn't, but, <laughs> uh, but I was my, the first 15 years of my pastoral ministry was in a, a small holiness denomination mm-hmm. where um, it was pretty much expected that there was uniformity of uh, teaching and opinions, and it was expected pretty much of clergy. In fact, it would have been it would have been pretty threatening to your ministry if you weren't pretty much consistent with denominational teaching and that kind of thing. And coming to the Methodist Church was kind of a refreshing thing for me because at, you know, at, at least in our we are a big tent. There's there's a broad spectrum of belief in the uh, or opinions in the Methodist Church. Probably mirrors the divide in the country about as close as any denomination. And so, at least coming to the Methodist Church, I found that uh, that. We could agree to disagree about things. We could see things differently, and uh, and still stay at the table. I was actually amazed when I first came to the Methodist Church that people could actually sit in a Sunday school class and have totally divergent opinions on something, yeah. and be in communion with each other, and yeah. and still because that really was not too common where I came from before. Now I know that if you would just scratch just beneath the surface of any of those folks in right. that pre- my previous denominational experience, there were differences of opinion, but the difference is we weren't free to say it. Yeah. So there's something freeing about that. So, I mean, and even if somebody, I, we know that there are folks in the pews that don't agree with every uh, institutional statement made by the Methodist Church. Um, but that's the beauty of, I think, our connection is that we can, we have been able to stay together. Let's hope that, hope that continues, you know. Right, right. One of the things that I brought up to, to our speakers is this, um, and some understood it better than others, our appointive system. And, and that we, as a part of the United Methodist tradition, um, the bishop, together in consultation with the cabinet and with our local churches, sends people and appoints people to communities. Um, and we hope that there is a good fit there, right? We, we look at gifts and, and um, talents and the needs of the particular community to make those matches. And um, I'll, sometimes we have pastors who feel that they have been placed in a community that's really difficult to love because they're different than they are. They're different than they are politically, sure. or theologically, right? Intellectually in some ways, it's just around the privileges of what kind of educational attainment they've had, or socioeconomically. And it makes pastoring sometimes hard, at least from what I hear these pastors talk about. And I ran a, across an article that Lovett Weems had, had written recently in his, his retirement for Lewis Center, and he was reflecting um, upon a phrase that Martin E. Muller used. Um, the people God has given us. And, and Lovett went on to say that this concept helped him better understand leadership, saying leadership is always about a group and never about the leader. The group may be a ball team, a choir, a congregation, or a nation. For religious leaders, the beginning point is always with the people of God given us and not with us. And I thought, well, you know, that's spoken like an itinerant mm-hmm. preacher who understands that sometimes you are sent to a place. And, you know, love it or hate it, that is the gift of the United Methodist uh, Church, right? Um, and Most of us have done both. Loved yeah, it and hated it. He loved it and hated it. <laughs> and, and But we learn in, in all of those situations. I wonder, because one of the things that I hear from some of our pastors is is just this tension of like I, I never asked for this congregation or I wouldn't have ever chosen this congregation and therefore find it very difficult to do pastoral ministry in that setting mm-hmm. um, as opposed to maybe a call system right where there's a lot of conversations and a lot of interviews and this congregation knows they're getting a conservative or a liberal or whatever those labels even mean anymore mm-hmm. right, right. Um, they know what they're getting, and so therefore it's supposedly a match made in heaven, um, yeah, which right. we know that's not always the case either, right? So I guess I'm wondering is how, how do you wrestle with, um, a, how do you fall in love with a congregation? I guess is the, is the point of the question. How do you fall in love with a group of people that the people of God sent to us? I, I think we do have to admit some appointments just don't work out. Mm-hmm. And it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's a person's fault or a congress. It, they just don't work out. And, you know, that's even in the call system, you know, two years and you're fired or something like that. Right. Yeah. But, but I think 
Part of me thinks we have to be open to be surprised in people that we're learning to love, you know, and that we can also love people that on first glance, we may think, oh, they're really different than us. Um, and they might teach us or surprise us something about love. I mean, it sounds a little Pollyannish, but I think there's something to the fact that we have to open ourselves up in the appointing system or as Christians to say somebody else may have a key to the scripture that I don't really have or I need to grow. Mm -hmm. So how do we learn to love them as we value their tradition and their experience? We may not like it, if you will, but they came to where they are because of their own faith journey and to come in and immediately go, well, I can't love these people. It's kind of like saying, well, mine's more authentic than yours. Right. Or mine's more realistic. I, I try to be brief. One of my favorite stories, and I hope I'm giving credit to the right person, is Kathleen Norris, the writer from Dakota, right. who um, I remember reading somewhere, and I hope it's her material, that she went to this little Presbyterian church in South Dakota, and this guy came up, and they argued all the time because he didn't agree with that, and he was a rancher. And, and then one Sunday she joined, and um, he came up to her and said, I'm glad you're in the body of Christ. And she said, I knew I wanted to be here. And I always that, that's always meant a lot to me because I think it means both of them had to move, yeah. and that's the body of Christ, not all of us thinking like Kathleen Norris or all of us thinking like this. This is really the body of Christ. And I, I, I came up in a little more conservative church, but sometimes when I visited, this is my prejudice, a church that's full of a lot of progressive people, actually it gets boring in a hurry. Mm. In some ways. Yeah. The, the diversity, I think, is more stimulating to my right. thinking than... It sounds nice to all be thinking the same way. It, it is Although it's probably like, a like it's almost I, like church. Probably some of the nastiest fights happen with people who all think alike. You know. Yeah. They, but so I always remember that story. Is I think it's meant a lot to me over the years. This is really the church. Is when we go. I don't like Bob's theology, but you know, that's the body of Christ, not yeah. me. I don't. I don't define it. Christ defines it, mm -hmm. which is bigger than. I was listening to a colleague's blog, basically a Facebook blog, uh, the other day, and he was talking about uh, how to converse civilly, but he made the comment that um, that we converse differently, we talk differently with people we know and understand and love than we do with people we don't know and understand and love, and so he, he just had a very practical suggestion. He said, maybe we ought to begin every difficult conversation by talking about our kids and grandkids. And by the way, Dale has pictures of his <laughs> granddaughter. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, and I think that's true because uh, I'm a highly relational guy, so mm -hmm. I tend to, to, to ask people about their story and hear stories. But it's so true. If you're in a church, you're appointed to a church, and you feel like you're a misfit, uh, you know, there, and there's not good connection, I, I, I think you can learn to, to love and appreciate the people, but only by hearing their stories, really. I mean, yeah. I, mean I, I do think you need to get on a some personal level, and as Dale suggested, you know, hear who they are. I mean, there's there's a reason they have the opinions they do. Their life is shaped, their life experience is shaped who they are. And uh, I, I think even if it's difficult and it's challenging, I, I think, you know, since all ministry is contextual, you gotta know your context and learn to appreciate at least something about the context in which you find yourself. Right. Because we are sent. We're not, you know, yeah. we're, we're sent, the bishop, I've heard, you know, at right start every year, the bishops say you're sent and find a yeah. way to find a way to to figure out the context that you're in and and love the folks and serve together. So. Yeah, you know, I I remember one of my mentors, you know, said that one of that is the primary work of, of being appointed to a place is figuring out how you can how you can love that group of people mm -hmm. and you really can't love someone until you know them. Right, and sure. in order to know someone, you have to be willing to actually spend the, the time with them to get to know. I remember a gentleman that he and I probably disagreed completely on almost every political, maybe some social issues. Even I thought, he, well, he surely just—he was almost—it was almost a caricature that he was so opposite of me and everything. But I spent—I got to spend a particular morning with him every week. Uh, because of something that he did in the church office. And so we would just visit. 
And the stories that he told me about his life really helped me begin to see him as a person. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right? And, and also, it helped me understand some of the positions he held on certain things um, that were very different than my personal experience and background. And helped it, oh, it humanized him to me. You know, sure. I had, had probably made him to be kind of an object. Right, like right. he was a he was a character. He was a stereotype in my mind, and therefore I kind of dehumanized him in that process. Right. Um, and I think that that happens more than we like yeah, to admit. It absolutely. happens pastor to congregation, and sometimes the other way around too. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to just add kind of what you were saying. I don't know how effective it was, but every year when late June after new appointments, I would write the PPR chairs and encourage them. To get to know your pastor apart from Sunday morning, take them out to dinner, ask about their family, because then they're not an object either. Right. And then if they come up and maybe even make a social stand, they also know why, because they grew up in this part of the country or this is their background. Um, so, you know, it's two way street, like Fred said. I mean, we, we have to encourage people to get to know us or give them the opportunity right. or be vulnerable ourselves at times. Right. To, to show who I mean, we are. And if I think there, it seems like more now than ever, like we have an opportunity as the church to kind of model a different way of being. Because right now, if you just, if you watch the news, if you look at the media, there's a whole lot of othering and objectifying the uh, whatever the other side is of any particular issue. There's not a whole lot of um, crossing the aisle, getting to know perspectives or what. I, I have I've given sermons on this before, but I really think what's not heard is the church teaching its language to the world. And our language is not only about certain things. Our language is, uh, the, what you don't hear is love, respect, forgiveness. I mean, on a political scene, on lots of scenes, nobody's using, or very few people are using those words. But I'm, a, I'm kind of afraid that the church is kind of silent now, too. And we're not saying, hey, part of the discussion is how do we love our, our neighbor? And I heard a sermon one time where a guy said, a person said, and it's true, he says, here's a, I don't know, but maybe it was after uh, some event that killed some people in America. But we're also struck by the fact that Jesus has loved your enemy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the church has... It's not as effective in throwing its conversation in to the mix as we are as like using other people's language and trying to make it sound Christian. So I think we've got a lot of work to do on love. And it sounds pie in the sky and silly, but who's talking about love and neighborliness and forgiveness? Right. It's not out there very much. Right. Or if it, it if it's used, it's it's in this kind of almost saccharine like superficial way that doesn't mean anything, <laughs> yeah. right? Rather than yeah. that hard work of love. You know, when you look at marriages that have been around for 50 years, you know, we have a tendency to romanticize that. That's, that's 50 years of really hard work, right? Of when yeah. love doesn't necessarily feel good. Sure, yeah. All the time. And I heard uh, a speaker one time, I, I, Dawn, is, she's in her name, but anyway, she said, our culture doesn't know what to do with how to portray on TV a 50-year happy marriage yeah. through the tough times. Through the tough times. Yeah, they don't know how to do that, yeah. so we don't see that on the media very much. Yeah. A good marriage has been through rough times. So Absolutely. We, you know, right. don't know as are good friendships, that. right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, sure. if you have a truly deep friendship that's never had any kind of conflict or tension in right. it or disappointment in it, I don't know that it's a real, a soul friendship. It might be an acquaintanceship, yeah. but it may not, maybe not a deep soul friendship. So, well, one of the things that uh, sort of related to this, when David uh, Gushy talked about, um, you know, you, you got the sense that he kind of was weird a little bit about yes. the political yeah. divide, and I think he seemed exhausted. Exhausted about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I shared it. I shared it, Mumsy, at least in one of the services, maybe several services, pre pre service comments that I that I weary of this whole thing about you know the left and the right. It, it's right. It, and and, uh, and it, it, even in the church and in the in the political world. But um, 
I, I guess I find myself longing for truly an ethic uh, of Jesus. To, I mean, because, you know, Jesus, to me, very often, most often, uh, you know, kind of cuts through the middle of some of this. I mean, there's a Christian ethic that seems to be sometimes not consistent with any political party or, or you know, left or the right or conservative theological or liberal. It's just, but it's sometimes it's, it's, it's so difficult for us to identify and then embrace the core, I think, of our Christian faith. That's what I, I long for, a real Jesus ethic, I guess. Mm -hmm. I tend to look for that when we're in the middle of these political divides. I find that it, it uh, and, and conversations that tend to just push us to, to our corners to where we, you know, shout at each other across the divide, that sometimes there's some real uh, wisdom in just the example and teaching and ethic of Jesus, you know. Now, um, I don't know, that, that, that's where I am. I yeah. mean, um, that's where I'm more comfortable anyway. I'm more comfortable right. if I can say, you know, this, this I, I see this mirrored in the life and example and teaching of Jesus. This is who we're called to be. And then don't get involved in the, you know, uh, the debates on either side. Just kind of lock down and center in on who we're um, to be as God's people. Right. You know, and then that, that Jesus ethic, I mean, in some ways that seems kind of aspirational. And I, I mean, I can imagine people saying, but, you know, Jesus, you know, turned over the tables and, you know, Jesus was very definitive about certain aspects well, of, um, yeah. right? And I, I think that that's maybe where, especially some of our clergy that are maybe just starting out, pastors are trying to figure out how to navigate these places and, and, and can't really figure out like where are you supposed to draw the line like what are the things what are the essentials with like th this is central or essential to who a Christian is uh, versus things that are you know op opinions or even stronger than that just like preferences of maybe the world we'd like to see like um, and I'm sure that you've all had ex you both have had experiences with people who despite your best efforts despite trying to demonstrate that you love them no matter where they are, they're just like I'm out of here. Like I can, you know, I, you know, what you're serving, I'm just, I just can't swallow sure. anymore. How do you yeah. deal with that? Because I think that that for most pastors I know that eats them alive. Like they, it just tears them up, and the emotional pain of losing folks hmm. is so much it almost paralyzes people. I think most of the speakers had said that. We all take it personally, no matter what the latest book we read or how much counseling we've had. It's like we take it personally, even though we, in our head, maybe don't think we should. Um, I remember when we had some kind of controversy at a church and a family left, and you know, I was laying awake at night and all this kind of stuff, and, and a retired doctor came in. And it's one of the lessons I, I value from Dr. Ferguson. He, he was beloved in the community. Mm -hmm. He came and he's physician. He says, you know what? Every once in a while somebody comes in and says, Dr. Ferguson, I can't stand you anymore. I'm leaving. And I, he says, it happens to us no matter what we do. I mean, I thought the community worshipped the ground he walked on, you know? And I always remember that, that sometimes there's nothing we can do. Right. Um, and my wife often reminded me, and I don't, I don't think it's a cop-out, sometimes people want to leave or be angry and they need something to hang it on so it's the choir the, the topic and really what they're kind of maybe saying at this point in my life i'm ready for something else mm -hmm. but it's hard to say look at all your friends i'm just leaving the church so I, I i think sometimes we can't stop it but that doesn't mean i wouldn't lay awake but um and sometimes <laughs> i also had somebody come in and, and again you don't want this to happen in a way, but somebody said, it's okay. This person came to our church angry at another church. They'll be there a while. So it's, it's really not a cop-out, but it's also a reality check, that it's not all about us, and it's not even always all about the topic. Right. It's about life, maybe they, their husbands and them are unhappy. I don't know what it is, but um, so sometimes we, when we personalize it, it becomes about us or my latest sermon. Sometimes it's just, Right. You know, um, and I think even in partisan times, people can say, well, it's the sermon you gave. Well, it might still be. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, sometimes it seems like people community. on their way out can can throw a jab. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. seems kind of unnecessary, <laughs> you know, um, that makes it more, per, you know, that it's hard to avoid. Like, it was because of you, you know, or that sermon you preached. Well, and, and something else you said, um, I'm a big believer, because I've done several, in pastors doing sabbaticals and time away. I think that's one place where you get yourself focused. It's not about you or... How do I separate my call from is we if we don't get away and give our soul attention and our care, self care, then we are tired. And I think just that's when we may say something we wish we hadn't or we we but but I I would tell PPR chairs, you know, give your pastor time off. But and the truth is sometimes pastors were their own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who felt like the church was pulled up if they weren't on duty six or seven days a week. And I don't think churches and feel that necessarily but I do think pastors would gain by a half a day getting out of town going to a movie get a different get out of that um, and then you you may not only love those people more but you may find a way out of this how to handle partisan issues because your mind's taken off that issue for now so I encourage days off sabbaticals I think we need it. I, I grew up on a farm. It took me 25 years to realize ministry is hard work, but it's not the same as hauling hay and doing right. corn, it's, but it's a different kind of hard work. Yeah. And we do need it. To, we, it is hard now. It is very hard. We, we often want to say something and we don't know whether we should. And that that's, takes a lot of energy yeah. to decide how to do that. What, what advice would you guys have for clergy who are scared? Who are who? Who are scared or fearful to say something? Sh least they turn people away, or it, wondering if it's the right thing. Especially in our current environment, like what advice do you have for pastors who are who are fearful? I wonder. I'm talking too no, much. Go ahead. I'm wondering sometimes if if we really feel that if we ought to test it mm -hmm. with our PPR chair, okay, or a trusted church member. Rather than wrestle with and say, I've got to say this and then say it. And, you know, if, if we hopefully have some, one or two people we trust in the church to say, you know, I'm feeling like addressing this. What, what's, what's your feedback? They may have a helpful hint. Um, that would be one thing. Um, and, and one of the words I've been thinking about a lot here is conscience. And sometimes conscience does make us do things, even at a risk. And I think we have to live with our conscience. You know, what can I, what can I live with? And uh, you know, I, I knew a, a seminary colleague who was very, and he was in a UCC church. He was terribly unhappy with it. Well, he made a conscious decision to get another denomination. Mm -hmm. And you have to respect him. Yeah. That I think the denomination he went to was great. No, but why sit and be angry and bitter for thirty right. years? So, I think. I feel like I'm a person who has heavy duty of conscience, and so mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to do it and see what happens. You know, I recently revisited um, John Wesley's sermon, which is called On Conscience, mm -hmm. where he talks about the role of our conscience, um, not in that sermon, but in, in other places, he talks about um, that we're not called to like a blind obedience, um, but a discerning obedience. Uh, the sermon is not exactly his word, but the sense of you have to kind of, you have to kind of make sure that the the experience of the Holy Spirit working within you aligns with these other places. Um, otherwise, you perpetuate systems like slavery, which is throughout Scripture, right? Like that. Mm -hmm. That's the place of the conscience to say this isn't this isn't right, and you have to figure out how to how to wrestle with it. What I worry about is sometimes. We're not willing to deal with the consequences of our decision. I was just going to say, wait, yeah. if you act unconscious, yeah. then you have to give some thought, how are you willing to deal? I, I remember in the 60s, I'm talking about, before great <clears throat> things of civil disobedience, Dr. King and others would tell people, here's what might happen. You might get beat. You might Now, this is civil disobedience, so you have to think about the consequences. And I think that's when somebody's really pushed to their conscious. They may say it, but they have to not go, gee, I didn't think anybody would be upset.
set or right. I thought, you know, they have to be ready uh, if folks really, really push back. Right. If you're at, if you're that driven by your conscience. Mm -hmm. Even to the point of job security, right? And I think that that's exactly. the thing that, sure. that most people don't don't always think through. That some some of the stances we may take, and they may be biblically grounded, um, and an absolutely the most faithful response we can do. It it could mean that job security is is at risk. Um, but even that's a faithful act, right? To to trust whether or not mm -hmm. you know God will provide even in the moments of you know. Yes. You know, my default is. My default is tends to be a little safer default. Uh -huh. What I mean by that is I, I, I tend to um, Adam Hamilton when he said you got to ask yourself if you do have your conscience tells you to speak to something, at the same time ask yourself the question, what's what's your goal? Right. Is it is it irritation and agitation right. or is it transformation? And if it is transformation, I mean, yeah. it doesn't do good to shout at strangers or people that disagree with you anyway, or or right. make a proclamation right. if you're not changing them. So for me. When I use, my default is generally, I am interested in transformation, uh, in, in seeing people come together and seeing you know minds and hearts changed. So that sometimes for me means that I that sometimes means that I have it, it changes the tenor of the conversation, it t changes what I say, maybe even when I say it, in the setting in which I say it. I I, I find that to be honest, an eight, 15, 20 minute sermon on Sunday morning. To a lot of people, feels not very dialogical at all, right? Because right. it's so easy to be perceived in that setting as making a proclamation, and then they have to deal with it. By golly, yeah. but, but what happens is, if somebody disagrees with you, they deal with it. All right, they show up at your office the next day, <laughs> which I've had that, you know. But so to me, I think if it's real transformation, I I find that sometimes. I mean, I'm not saying that public proclamation from the pulpit that disturbs the comfortable. Right. Uh, is 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 wrong at all? But but I'm saying for me sometimes the default is asking myself: Is this really best addressed Sunday morning in big church with everybody there? Is this something that's better addressed in conversation in a group setting and study, whatever? Um, and so in that sense, maybe I'm not very prophetic in terms of trying to you know uh, stir the waters too much. I'm generally trying to think of if transformation is the goal. How do you have conversations that actually bring people together right um, well we so. did we did hear that quite a bit because I asked the question as somebody who um, you know thinks about communication a lot realizing the full platform that we have at our fingertips is not just that 20 to 35 minute right. sermon moment which is a monologue for the most part I think some sure. of our pastors may be doing some innovative things there that makes it more dialogical um, and allows for feedback for the vast majority of Methodist pastors in Missouri that I've seen it's a 25 minute speech, right? Where there's not a lot of room for people to provide feedback other than their strong or kind of um, milk toast reaction sure, to right. it. Um, and I would agree, like trying to find other places f for the simple sake of transformation, if that's what we're called to do. Right. That, that, that sermon moment, that proclamation aspect is not always the most transformative opportunity. Um, guys, we just have a couple more minutes, and besides my mom responding on Facebook, which of course, you know, your mom's got to, you know, pay attention. Hi. I don't see a lot of, <laughs> yeah, say hi to my mom, um, a lot of uh, comments, um, and I think our conversation has been, been great. Is there anything else that you would want to kind of offer up to pastors who are kind of wading in on these, uh, kind of into these waters? Any advice that you'd give? Um, from your decades of experience doing this, doing this work, any thoughts that you would share with them? One of the speakers, I thought, said, I think we do need to remember to give ourselves grace. Mm -hmm. Even if we blow it, we lose a job or something. I mean, we're loved by God, and we, we can mess up in lots of ways, aren't we? Right. We can mess up in our marriage, we can mess up with our health care, we can mess up. So it doesn't mean we're bad persons. I think we need to remember that. It, and it's scary stuff. I mean, it is mm -hmm. scary. Some of this is scary stuff. And uh, um, I just mentioned to Fred at lunch, I read a book about history of the Methodist Church in Nebraska 100 years ago. They had scary stuff they were dealing with, too. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was helpful for me to kind of realize it's been happening before and it will right. again. But I think grace is important. 
we do have a tendency to think the moment we're in right now is the worst or right. the best that it's ever been, right? Right. Yeah. To be honest, I don't have a whole lot of advice to give out. I think I see pastors doing a much better job maybe than I'm doing <laughs> balancing this uh, rather than the other way around. But um, but it, it I do think that centering in on relational capital and no, getting that that one piece is hugely important. No matter whether you're a new pastor or been there for a while, investing in relationships and then understanding your context uh, before you decide to do or as you are doing whatever you're doing in proclamation and pushing, especially in difficult conversations in these kind of divided times, that it's it's a no-brainer to focus on relationships, lead relationally, preach relationally, and uh, and know who you're, know the context that you're in. That, that's kind of bottom line for me. But right. I think most people know that, but sometimes we forget to we exercise do. that. Which know? reminds me that, you know, part of the critical piece of this, and I think um, at least a couple of our, our the pastors on our panels um, or discussions said, is you got it. you can't do this in isolation. You, you know, to be in a, yeah. in a uh, clergy covenant group or to have people within your own context who, your PPRC, a good lay leader, to be in conversation around that, that to do this hard work in isolation is, is dangerous business. It is. So, well, thank you both for joining us. Uh, thanks for um, everybody that joined us as well. And I'll just put another plug in. If you missed a couple of our episodes in the webinar series, go to mumethodist.org forward slash partisan times webinars, and you can view any of those webinars, as well as there is a link to additional resources if you want to investigate some of the writings of the pastors and lay theologians that we talk to and, and learn a little bit more about how to navigate uh, these partisan waters that we find ourselves in. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye.